Um, I wanted to uh, first introduce Numerai and then um, share my screen and show you a few things. Um, so the first, uh, the first thing about Numerai is that we're uh, kind of an open hedge fund. We give away all of our data for free and allow anyone in the world to model the data that we give. So usually it's the last thing a hedge fund would ever do, but Numerai does it because we want to get the best possible talent looking at our data. Um, so it's almost a little bit like a Kaggle competition, if you're familiar with that, um, except all the data is obfuscated. So you have no idea really what you're modeling, but for any good data scientist, you can still find the structure of the data without knowing what the features are. Um, but I did want to share a little bit about what is unique about um, the stock market um, and the most common problems that people have uh, with overfitting um, it, in machine learning are kind of somehow way worse in finance. And uh, this isn't very well understood by, by most people. And so I'll try to share some of the, some of the um, so this is your classic uh, back test. Um, it, uh, it has a, a kind of very good historical portion uh, where you trained your model um, and then it just stops working uh, whenever you trade it live. Your performance gets much worse. And this is the common pattern you see. Um, and, uh, you know, on the one hand, yeah, mach all machine learning pro problems have this. If you, you can easily overfit uh, a face detection algorithm and have, you know, your in-sample performance uh, or even your holdout performance be worse than some other new set that you're shown later. But there is something special about finance where this is very common um, and uh, perplexes a lot of people. Um, so first, just to show you a little bit about numerized data to uh, describe this problem. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is a, you can get this on GitHub. It's just a, called our analysis and tips uh, notebook. And it shows the, all the data uh, that we have. This is what it looks like. You have um, all these features and we call them off the Dungeons and Dragons uh, names. And um, you also have a target and the target variable um, and the features are obfuscated to you, but you're trying to basically use these features to model this target. So it seems like a very simple supervised learning problem. And if you treat it that way, uh, you will do quite badly <laughs> because there's a few things that, um, I'm sorry, there's a few things that you're missing. So the first, the first thing to notice is this column called era. Now the big problem with stock market data is time. And uh, there's a lot of uh, problems with the data modeling because all the data is in different times of time periods. And we call these eras on Numerai. And what happens is people, if people ignore the eras, they think their model's a lot better than it really is. And they end up uh, uh, making a model that doesn't generalize very well. And so you have to kind of take care that there, there is this time component. And um, there aren't that many eras. There are only about a um, hundred, hundred and or something eras. And so, when you think about modeling this data, even though there's half a million rows, if there are very few eras, eras are the important thing. Eras are what's unique because in that time section, uh, all everything inside that time section, that era is happening at the same time. So the data isn't uh, independent by row. It's only independent by era. So this is over a decade of data, but you actually have um, very little, uh, you actually have very little number of independent observations. So that's one key thing. And then the other key thing is how the features uh, interact with each other. So what happens with most models, going back to this, is w during the learning phase, uh, when you train on historical data, what happens is your model will pick up on the best, the best risk for that period, not the best alpha for that period, the best risk for that period. So if it was a period where momentum of, of common stock factor did well, um, or a period where value did well, these things will come out extremely strong in say the coefficient of a linear model that you made. And the trick in some ways with finance is kind of very strange. You have you have to model, you have to create a model 
that sort of has some co kind of coefficients on the features to predict something. But at the same time, you want the, the coefficients on the features to be as low as possible. And so it's like a strange problem because, um, because you, in some ways, you don't want to have risk exposures to the features uh, because they're really just adding risk and they're not um, adding alpha. So what, what happens uh, on Numeri, a lot of our users uh, do something called feature neutralization. Um, and feature neutralization is, uh, is, we have it in this example script that we give out. If you go to our website, you can download all this data for free and these example scripts. Um, you can, we actually uh, include a, a little bit of code that, uh, that does a, a, a linear projection. So what this is doing is saying, well, you've built a nonlinear model, right, with a neural net, but I don't want to take on all these linear exposures to what are really just risks. Um, and this does this linear projection, uh, projects out these risks and leaves what's left, the really high quality alpha, the alpha that isn't just something that's in the features um, uh, in a linear way. And what tends to happen if you can uh, take off those features, then suddenly your, your estimates go down and you're like, well, geez, I actually don't have as good a model as I think in sample, but it's actually a model that generalizes very well out of sample. Um, and in most machine learning, typically the feature that you like the most is the feature you really want to keep. But in finance, the feature you like the most is the most dangerous risk that you're exposed to. And uh, you, have to, you have to reduce that risk. Otherwise, your model won't generalize and you'll do extremely badly um, in live data. So that's kind of like a little bit of a secret about, um, about how to make your models generalize in finance. There's so much more to it. Um, and I hope you get to take a look at the data and see some of this uh, for yourself. Thank you. The first question that I have is actually, so there's something very unintuitive to me as somebody who comes from science into machine learning about the idea that you'd want to, that you'd want an unsparse model, right? That you'd want, it seems like this neutralizing feature exposure idea, you try and, you try and have as many small parameters across as many pieces as possible. And in science, you're often trying to find a sparse linear model rather than a diffuse nonlinear model. So can you comment on why you think there's that big of big gap between what works and is useful in, in science and what works and is useful in finance? Yeah, it's a, re it's a really good question. I mean, the, the, the way to think about it is kind of like that the risks and the, and the alphas are kind of dual. Um, on the one hand, anything you find, any, any exposure you find that you think is an alpha, uh, meaning something that has correlation, subsequent correlation with returns, um, it could just as easily kind of turn around. And, um, and so if you want to operate for, it's almost like you you have the assumption of, well, the market's actually efficient to every single feature that I have. Of course it is. Everybody's going to have learned from the past data. So what, what actually will generalize uh, is when I decorrelate myself from those basic factors and make a hedge fund that's quite differentiated from all the exposures that everyone else is taking on. I see. Yeah, because I think the motivation in science is to find a causal model of what's going on. That is, if I, if I find something that's sparse, if I apply a sort of like Occam's razor, then I'm finding something that's the real underlying model that causes these uh, the phenomena that I'm observing. But in finance, you don't necessarily want a causal model. Right, you want a you want a really good predictive model. Exactly, and and what we see in in our data is if you, in some ways, the less you know about your mo how your model works, the better. It's like it's somehow especially good for for machine learning. A linear model, like I said, would only have just positive or negative coefficients on the features, and and if you took those down to zero, you'd have nothing left. But a nonlinear model, there's actually something left, and that's often the gold. Um, and that's what we want people to focus on learning because that tends to generalize better. Hmm. Interesting. Um, and so then how do you see, so there's this idea of neutralizing feature exposure. How does that play into this new numerized signals 
tool that you're putting out or this new sort of kind of contest? Yeah, so Numerai Signals is a brand new thing we launched uh, just about two weeks ago. And uh, like I said, with Numerai, we give out all of our data. And our data is kind of expensive. It's this high quality data you probably couldn't find, but it's all in this obfuscated way. But there are people out there who maybe have some of their own data already. And they have cobbled together some Yahoo Finance data and combined it with some Bloomberg data. And they've built their own signal out of that. And we want to say, well, if you have a signal like that, you should come to us too. Uh, we also want signals made on data that isn't ours. And that's what Numerai Signals is. You can come and submit your signal to us and get rewarded for it. But the twist is we are not really looking for a signal that is really correlated with return, really predictive of return. Um, in some sense, we, because we already have a lot of signals that are predictive with return. So if you bring a model that we already have, uh, we kind of think we should pay you zero. Um, but if you bring a model that is uncorrelated from everything we have, i.e. neutral to everything we have, like a projection off everything we have, and also still has alpha even after we do that neutralization to your signal, then you really have something. And that's much more valuable. And we pay a lot for that. Hmm. I see. So then, uh, so how do you generate... I guess, so if I'm sitting here at home making my, uh, my signal that I want to send to Numerai, like what, what kinds of things can I do to ensure that, that what I think is valuable is also what you guys are going to think is valuable? Like how do, I, how do I seek alpha, so to speak? Yeah, no, it is, it is something of a black box. Um, what we do say is anything basic probably won't work. So we have, no surprise, we have the PE ratio of every single stock in the world and we have it for 15, 18 years or so. So if you come with, and you just start submitting the PE ratios of stocks, we will neutralize that by our PE. You'll have nothing left and you won't, you won't do well. But if you create a complicated model and it's on unusual data, uh, then you're very likely to have a good portion of that be orthogonal to the models produced on Numerai and the data that we have. So basically it's like, don't give us something, you know, kind of everyone has, and then you'll be, you'll be good. Um, so, I mean, perhaps some of this stuff is, is per proprietary information, but what do you, do you have any examples of signals that have been useful in this tool so far or like a, a prototypical example to share? Well, we have been surprised by some of them. Um, we thought, we thought it was kind of, so Numerai we say is the hardest data science tournament in the world because you have to deal with all these problems. It's not just like downloading a, a Kaggle data set and building an XG boost. There's a lot more to think about and it goes deep. Um, and that's why we have users who've been there for many years. Um, but signals, we were very surprised to see that in the first few days of it, there were people uploading signals that were very orthogonal and um, had a lot more orthogonal uh, than we could even like make ourselves um, if, we if we really tried. Um, so the, it does seem like, and there's some people in Japan that are really strong. Um, there are also some people, uh, you know, from Numerai itself who've started building signals. So I think we're pretty surprised and um, who knows what data sets they're using to create these, right? We don't know. They never give us their model or their data. They're only giving us the output of their signal. So it's kind of cool in a way, like we don't really know what they're doing to generate these things. I see, interesting. Maybe, uh, so I guess one of the famous examples of the application of machine learning in finance uh, was you know, predicting crop yields months ahead of time using satellite data. I forget who the people were who, who did that. I don't know if you recall. Um, but uh, that, so is that the kind of thing that generates the signals that you would be interested in? Uh, or is it maybe a little bit more financial data? Yeah, that, I think that is always kind of like, a, that's a bigger story than it's like real. Uh, the, the, the main alternative data uh, that you want is going to apply to lots of stocks. And so if someone told me something about one stock, 
that's not a quant model. That's not a signal. That's just someone's stock tip. And numerized signals isn't for that. It's for like broad cross-sectional. You, you have some data that applies to 5,000 stocks. And it could be some NLP signal based off Twitter or it could be anything, but usually it's got to be really broad for us to be valuable. Because we never put the fund in one stock, right? So we, we need right, broad. Right, signal. certainly. That seems, that seems, I don't know that much about finance, but that, <laughs> sounds, like, that sounds like a bad idea. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have, so we got a question in the Q and A, and I actually encourage folks uh, watching on YouTube and folks in Zoom to post in the in the Q and A or in the live chat uh, to ask questions, and I'll and I'll forward them to Richard. Uh, so the question is, you know, how is this orthogonality assessed? Um, like, what you know, you've given a couple of examples of of ways to think about what this ortho orthogonality means and sort of uniqueness or originality. What more can you say about that? Well, that, that code I shared earlier was super, you know, uh, high level, but the code is exactly what we use, but we do it with every single feature that we have. So there are about 310 features that we have, and they're also what we call like nine risk factors, like country risk or sector risk, or um, because if someone posts a model that it really only did well just because it had exposure to the tech industry and the tech industry happened to do well, that's again, not what we're looking for. Um, so uh, it's, it is, and, and mathematically, it's, it's making this uh, linear projection. It's regressing out all the linear exposures that you have to the things we have, and your, what's remaining is what's, uh, what's valuable to us. I see. Um, so yeah, so you mentioned, I guess, yeah, NLP signals maybe of, of behavior of users on social media. Um, those sound like, uh, those sound like useful features. Any other thoughts about what, what things might be orthogonal? Yeah, I think NLP is quite a big one. It's one I'm like quite excited about. Um, we have, we actually did buy some news sentiment data, but they kind of mess it up. And if you look at it from like, if we, whenever we go talk to a new data vendor, they say, oh, we have all this data. We test it. It's got no original compared to what we already have. Um, so, uh, I like that we're putting it out to the world and saying, you know, you can, anyone can kind of be a data vendor to us and provide any, mm. but NLP is the one I'm kind of the most excited about. And we have a user who's, who's really experienced with NLP and has, uh, even written some numeri jokes with GPT three, uh, before, uh, to show us. And, and I, I think it's not really, I kind of, I kind of, yeah, like I said, I'm quite skeptical of like the alternative data craze. There's a lot you can do with kind of very good modeling on normal data. And there's a lot of text out there that companies have to produce about their funds or have to make statements um, about their companies. So mining that data, that, because it's already quite structured, I think there's quite a lot even there uh, that we wouldn't have and that would do well. Yeah, I guess what I'm what I'm kind of aiming at is uh, you in your numerize signals blog post on on Medium, you asked sort of uh, where is the next Ken Griffin, and it seemed like one of the motivations you had was this idea that that you know the power of crowds of people in garages with internet connections to like find signals. So I guess, um, like, yeah, what what do you think? Those next Ken Griffins, it seems like alternative data sources aren't the, aren't the right thing. But what do you think those next Ken Griffins are and should be working on? Well, the, the other side of, um, of it is that uh, Numeri signals is just one week long predictions, whereas Numera is one month long. And so there's actually a lot of things that work on a one week time horizon that would not work on a one month horizon. And a lot of that is actually technical uh, data, which is data that's kind of built from the price series. And oftentimes you can be, you can have a very good technical model, but because it trades so often, uh, you don't really make money off the costs. But mm -hmm. technical features would be great. Uh, and we don't have uh, lots of technical features at Numeri. And so I would say what's quite nice about that is anyone can make those. You just need the price. And mm -hmm. there's very easy access to get the price data and then you can make your own technical features. So I think a lot of models will be like that. Interesting. 
Um, what do you think the next sort of, you know, short term, shorter term than the master plan of building the last hedge fund? Um, what are sort of the shorter term ways you want to extend either the core data science tournament or the signals product? Well, it's, yeah, it's just two weeks old. It's doubling every week so far, uh, but it's just two weeks. Um, we think there will be a lot of staking there. There's the, the way Numerai works is you stake your models. Numerai has $5 million or so, maybe four and a half million dollars staked. Signals just started, but has $24,000 staked. Um, a year ago, all of Numerai put together was $20,000 staked. So it's really grown a lot. And um, uh, the main focus is on those two things for now in the medium term. Um, and, you know, the one thing we've also been building for, for a while and we haven't um, taken on uh, capital to our fund. So at some point next year, we'll probably do that. Um, but ultimately the fund is really just for institutional investors and uh, it's not really open to the public or our users. Um, but I think the exciting thing is, you know, is the master plan to monopolize intelligence, number one, monopolize data, number two, which is what Signals is about, getting external data in. And the third thing is monopolize money. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we're kind of going step by step. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there's this investor who you may have heard of. He uh, lives in Nebraska, so you might not have heard of him, but Warren Buffett, who says that you should only invest in companies that have moats. So what do you think are, like, as you mentioned, you know, Monopolize shows up in the master plan of Numerai a couple of times. So what do you think allows you to sort of build those moats to protect your monopolies in, um, in data uh, and in intelligence? Well, I think you can make, um, you know, Monopoly, it's some like, it has negative connotations, but it's a kind of good word, I think, for what we're trying to say. Um, we don't, we want to be the best data science community and the most, uh, high paying and rewarding community. Um, and we've already paid out over $40 million to our data scientists. There are a number of millionaires from Numerai and not only people know that. And I think the community is the whole thing. We don't trade our own model. Every, if you decide to rip your data out of signals, we don't have it anymore. If you decide to pull your model out of Numerai, we don't have it anymore. So we're really relying on the fact that we can make these incentives that bring a community together. And because they're staking and engaged and making a lot more than they could in other ways, it's going to get really big. And, um, and they won't be a reason to, to quit. Um, and I do liken it's kind of like to a Bitcoin, like you can think of our users almost as being the miners of Bitcoin or something. And uh, they're, mm. they're da doing data mining on our data and then they're earning our cryptocurrency. And it's very sticky once you get a lot of miners. It's suddenly, well, this mm. is the best place to be. Why would I move? And I, I think that's happening with us. And I think a lot of our users like it for that reason. I see. And in some ways, an even better analogy than to the Bitcoin miners would be to the Bitcoin traders, right? To the people who have been like trading various forms of various coins and tokens. So do you see that as one of your sort of competitors for mind share and users? Or what, um, like, what would you say are some of your uh, like competitors, if, if there are any? Yeah, I do have a kind of a pet hatred of, uh, of crypto traders, actually. Um, they even call themselves uh, DGENs, um, uh, but uh, they're they, not very likable. Like <laughs> it's not something they aim for, it seems. Yeah, yeah, and they're not super focused on the long term or the consequences of their actions, but that's fine. Um, the I think you know ultimately the equity markets are a lot sort of better for the world um, than the crypto markets, and I, if you were an expert trader at Ponzi schemes, I don't think you should be proud of yourself. Um, uh, you, you know, no matter how good you are, you're doing, you're doing the wrong thing. So yeah, but yeah, I think some of our users are very interested in crypto. Obviously we have a cryptocurrency, so I don't hate crypto all through and through. I love the applications of crypto and the fact that you can use it to build communities and do things like staking. But um, yeah, we need to compete with uh, the mindshare of uh, the DeFi DGENs. And some of the people, mm. there's been some crypto projects that sort of say, 
you can just stake your cryptocurrency here and do nothing and earn 300% a year. And uh, it's like, okay, well, that, how does that work long term? And everyone's mm -hmm. like, we don't really care about the long term. So I think for Numerai, whenever people are using Numerai and staking on Numerai, it's much more about the long term and it's much more about doing something like real. Um, one last question uh, from Michael in the Zoom Q and A: Are you do you see the quality of the meta model that is that is sort of generated by the data science tournament tournament improve over time? Do you think there's a limit, and do you expect the same thing to happen with the output of the Signals project? There is a very strange thing happening with uh, the meta model. So the meta model combines all the numeri models together, and if you look at it over the last year it's climbing. Not every week, some weeks it'll drop down, someone pulls their model out or something, but it's climbing kind of linearly. And you really should think there's like an asymptote to this, right? And we haven't been changing the data, so it's not like it's going up because of the data. We've given out some tips and validation data and other things, but it's quite impressive to me how it's still going up. And so I really like that idea of, you know, even if we did nothing, the community would make everything better um, without us releasing features. And that's the problem with most hedge funds. They, they find it hard to scale because they always have to be running out, buying new data, trying new things. And it's, it's very chaotic, but Numeri, it's kind of even more chaotic, but the incentives keep it all aligned. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, well, that's, that's good to hear. I'm excited to, you know, I think collaboration is a really important uh, thing that both, the machine learning community and the finance community could do better on. So I'm glad to, to hear from somebody who's, who's putting so much into making that work well. Yeah, you're welcome.